Monterey, California, a rare and endangered sea otter of the East Pacific. This film is the story of a species that has twice narrowly escaped extinction. The cause of death is unknown. The uh, autopsy is being performed for determination of cause, and de cause of death and other scientific information on the, on the animal. There is probably an underlying skull fracture which is probably related uh, to trauma. Whether or not this is the immediate cause of death that ought to be determined by autopsy. Today, off the coasts of California and Alaska, only scattered remnants of sea otters still live. Once there were vast colonies of otters, ranging freely from Lower California up through the Aleutian chain to Siberia. But the sea otter's soft, glossy coat, necessary for his survival, proved to be his undoing. Two centuries ago, the sea otter's fur was first coveted by Japanese nobles and feudal lords. Then fur hunters from Russia discovered rich otter colonies in Alaska. Catherine the Great, enraptured by the new furs, ordered a floor-length mantle. And for a hundred years, the Russians would compete with the Spanish, British, Japanese, and Americans in a fur-hunting gold rush that would all but wipe out the species. By nature trusting, the otters were easily slaughtered by spear, gun, and club. Neither mother nor pup was spared. Finally, south of Amchitka, the sea otter was considered extinct. But 30 years ago, in small numbers, the sea otter began to reappear. Little is known about this wild animal nearly lost to the world, miraculously come back and today once again threatened. Now Captain Cousteau and his divers will film for the first time the underwater life of this shy sea mammal and study what is essential for its survival as it faces its second brush with oblivion. In search of the northern sea otter, Calypso enters frigid Alaskan waters, following the sea lanes of early fur traders who had hunted the otters to near extinction. We startled a great herd of stellar sea lions. We came with good intentions, but man has established a bad reputation here in the wild. They are luckier than the persecuted sea otter. Their skins are of no great commercial value, their number is still secure. The sea otters are thinly scattered over the vast Aleutian chain. The kelp beds are their natural habitat, but the thousands of kelp floats can be mistaken for sea otters. It makes it difficult to locate them. We continue our search both above and below the kelp beds. It is here, protected by the Fur Treaty of 1911, that the sea otter staged his comeback. It is in this majestic marine wilderness that the sea otter, once a land animal, dives and hunts for his food. Our divers familiarize themselves with its weird, ice-cold environment. 
The Alaskan king crab, of heroic size and formidable armor, prowls the bottom. He is a favorite delicacy of the Northland otter. The otter still eludes us. The holdfasts anchoring the kelp look like the roots of great trees. But they are fragile anchors, as they do not penetrate the soil. We are enraptured by the alien beauty of the sea otters and the water forest. Floating bulbs filled with carbon dioxide produced by the respiration of the plant, hold up these sequoias of the sea. Kelp are among the longest plants on Earth. Ascending along seems an eternity. In the half-light of the subarctic dawn, when they are most likely to surprise half-asleep otters, Bernard Chauvelin and Raymond Cole head for the craggy, wind-worn shores of Sanac Island. Unlike the California otter that has been driven from land by civilization, the Alaskan otter often takes refuge on land to escape savage storms and gales that reach 120 miles per hour. On the protected side of the island, there are still no otters in sight. A very young harbor seal is discovered beached by low tide. With their nets, Chauvelin and Cole will try to return the wriggler to the sea. Its mother waits. A sea otter, at last. Unlike the otters living in California, which usually drag their hindquarters, the northern otters can raise their ramp high off the ground and walk alternately on all fours. They walk better because, undisturbed by man, they walk more often. Chauvelin and Cole need to return a pair of otters to the Calypso. The netted otters will be transported to Calypso, where in a saltwater pool, food and the security of kelp await them. Captain Cousteau observes two specimens of the only marine mammal of the mustelids that still survives. Adequate knowledge of his biology, habits, and requirements for survival is presently lacking. It is needed to fortify the otter's comeback. Otter, with your bristling silver whiskers, you look most wise to me. And wise enough you were to escape your natural enemies for many thousands of years, until man cheated and came with guns. Guns that are unfair to wisdom. The otters groom tirelessly, squeezing water from their fur. For insulation, air has to be constantly reintroduced into their thick pelage. 
to help maintain their 100 degree body temperature. A blanket of kelp is more comforting than warming. Otters embrace when they are anxious or frightened. On board, we can provide only essentials, but for these wild creatures, that is far from sufficient. Nature is their home. We will return them there. Captain Cousteau has the otters returned to Cherney Reefs, where they were discovered. For the double-crested cormorant, the bleak Aleutians are also home. Like the sea otter, the cormorant dives for its food in the icy waters of Alaska. Now the Calypso team will stretch a net across an inlet they have chosen within the otter's home range. It will contain the pair of otters and make possible underwater observation under conditions closer to their natural habitat in the wild. The otters are released within the netted confines of the Long Cove. Calypso cameramen will provide the first film record of the underwater swimming techniques of the northern sea otter. Otter swims primarily on his back. His large flat webbed feet combine with his slightly flattened tail to give him great power and maneuverability. The otter is tempted by his favorite food but refuses to eat from the hand of man. He finds reassurance in rejoining his companion. A meal offered from a distance is eagerly accepted. Having no reserve fat layer, like whales and seals, otters cannot go long without food. To maintain weight and body temperature in the icy sea, northern otters must eat up to 20 pounds a day, or one-fourth their body weight. Eating only on the surface, using their chests as tables, they feast on Alaskan king crab. After the banquet, the otters come ashore to groom their fur and warm themselves. The otter enclosure lures the puffin, or sea parrot. He flies in and dives, using his wings to search for food. The slow motion camera captures the spectacular sea parrot flying underwater. <laughs> to protect the bird from entanglement, Louis Preslin gives the puffin a boost over the net, directing it towards safer hunting.
Insatiable, one of the otters is ready to eat again and accepts food from Preslin's hand. And now, the supreme luxury, to caress a living fur. The otters respond to patience and kindness. Never before has a wild sea otter eaten food on shore. The sun travels low across the Aleutian Islands. In the stillness of the Alaskan wilderness, evening comes early and lingers long. On cold and distant shores, thousands of miles from home, we now feel a sense of belonging, a harmony with our neighbors. Captain Cousteau leaves Calypso for the otter enclosure. Work with the northern sea otter of the Aleutian chain is completed. The net will be lowered, the otters released to their full range. The otters quietly head south to the open sea. They have endured with us a few days of semi-captivity. Yet minutes after their liberation, they are at ease in freedom. The freedom the otter enjoys, I try in vain to imagine, to feel what it really means to him. He's not enslaved to a home, nor to a lifetime mate, nor to any kind of security. Freedom is adventure, and life has no boundary. Monterey Harbor, bustling hub of Central California's fishing industry. Cannery Row, trawlers, dive boats, pleasure craft. It was amidst this hubbub and heavy offshore traffic to the south that the extinct California sea otter made its miraculous reappearance. The Orkia, commissioned for sea otter research by Philippe Cousteau, approaches a colony of otters off Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station. Dr. James Madison, Jr. is to contribute to the study. In 1911, the California otter was considered extinct. Years later, there were occasional sightings by lighthouse keepers and rangers, but these were kept secret because of the danger of poachers. Then in 1938, a small herd was viewed from a new coast highway, and the secret of the unsinkable sea otter was out. Now in the Zodiac, with a friendship offering of food, 
Philippe Cousteau approaches the animals to observe them more closely. Otters wrap themselves in kelp to keep from washing ashore while resting or sleeping. They try to move without getting their paws and feet wet to avoid heat loss from their bare limbs. Since they spend their lives at sea, they groom endlessly. Dirt and oil mat their fur and destroy insulation which can lead to death. No matter the otter's age or sex, the otter's moustache has earned it the name Old Man of the Sea. Otters often bite each other when they become alarmed and sniff the breeze suspiciously. They are made uneasy by the scent of men. Their favorite smell is food. As in Alaska, it is hoped food will be the breakthrough. But the otters here have even less reason to trust man. The otters, once nearly killed off by these two-legged predators, instinctively take evasive action. Any rapprochement between man and animal, for now at least, seems impossible. At Monterey Pier, Captain Cousteau arrives to join the Calypso team in California. He is introduced to Judson E. Vanderveer, who's engaged in sea otter research at Hopkins Marine Station, and who has been helping Philippe in his study of the southern sea otter. In all of their experience in Alaska, Captain Cousteau and his divers had never seen such a gathering of sea otters. Now, Judd, how many others do you estimate are right here in this area? 46. 46? <laughs> Did you count them all? Yes. <laughs> I think he counts them about 10 times a day. <laughs> the comeback of the southern sea otter has been remarkable. But the piece of paper that protected his skin in the Fur Treaty of 1911 could not begin to cover the perils that abound in the world to which he has returned. Now, Jed, what are the enemies today here? Well, the greatest threat to, to them here is the uh, possible injury by boat, small boat traffic. You mean propellers? Yes, but and in addition to that uh, threat, there's also the threat throughout the entire range of oil spill from a possible tanker collision or a tanker accident of some kind. I understand that occasionally some hunters are, are caught. Well, killing them. Yes, the otters are shot perhaps for target practice or also shot, uh, especially in the Morro Bay area by I enraged. thought they were protected by law. They are. But, what uh, kind of law? What well, the, it's what a kind one, of protection is it? It's, it's just a threat. Completely of, forbidden? Yes, well, yes. And what's the penalty? The penalty is $1,000 fine or six months in prison or both. Look at them. Cousteau is amazed that this colony of wild creatures can exist so close to highways, housing, and the cacophony of civilization. Philippe Cousteau will now attempt to photograph the otter, unapproachable on the surface, beneath his canopy of kelp. In 
panic, the otters flee from our divers. But perhaps for the first time, the southern otters meet divers that are not hostile. The otters are afraid, but curious. It took us a long time to realize it is the sight and sound of our bubbles that scatter them out of reach. We would have to find another way to approach them. From these rocks, otters have pried loose tenacious abalone, taken them to the surface for a meal, and discarded the shells. Determined otters are known to dive in deep water 20 times to hammer loose one abalone. On the way up, our camera light heightens a curious otter. This shy clown of the kelp does not yet know he has met his match in this game of hide and seek. In Monterey County's Stillwater Cove, the Cousteau team will make another attempt to film the sea otter underwater. This time they will use silent diving gear. Louis Preslin fills an oxygen rebreather canister with soda sorb crystals. The chemical absorbs carbon dioxide as the diver recycles the oxygen. This eliminates the emission of the massive bubbles that frighten the otters. Great care must be taken that no water enters the canister, as this would reduce efficiency and lead to caustic burns of the mouth. A young otter alerts the elders to approaching danger. The oxygen rebreather is dangerous equipment. Divers must have knowledge, training, and experience to use it safely. Pure oxygen is released into the diving lung. The diver must completely flush his own lungs to eliminate nitrogen. If correct procedures are not followed, divers may black out from lack of oxygen or drown from oxygen convulsions below 20 feet. The silent rebreather was designed for warfare. It becomes useful for peaceful observations of animal behavior. Philippe Cousteau and Jacques Delcouterre quietly slip underwater. But otters have sensitive surveillance systems. Although there are no bubbles to fear, they are still apprehensive of man. In the quietude, suspicion begins to give way to increasing interest in the peace offerings from Del Couterre. Tentatively at first, a special relationship develops with a young black male, the first to take food, a spiny urchin planted by Del Couterre. In time, the men would become very attached to Esprit, the bold one, as they would begin to call him. After their departure from Monterey, the Calypso team would be distressed to learn from Judd Vanderveer of Esprit's death from shotgun wounds. He had learned to trust and forgotten that not all men are worthy of trust. Esprit gets away with a planted abalone. As the otter gathers his food, we are reminded of the natural interdependence of otters, urchins, abalone, and their shared home, the kelp forest. The sea otter's favorite food is the urchin, which uncontrolled destroys the kelp upon which the abalone, a vegetarian, is dependent. Before the otters were slaughtered and the abalone fished, there was a balance of kelp beds, urchin, abalone, and otters stretched along the entire coast. As we now provide an overabundance, greed sets in. Thank you.
the sea otter is one of the few tool-using animals. To break the shell of the urchin, this otter takes along a rock. This otter uses one urchin to break another. Ça s'est bien passé? Oui, elle avait grand faim. The rebreather dives have been successful. Now it's happy feeding time. Succulent abalone provides its own plate. Noisy neighbors, with manual dexterity, pound turban snails on rocks, used like anvils on their chests. Sea otters are able to use a rock, not merely as an anvil, but also as a hammering tool. Observed from shore, in their haven of kelp, the otter's life appears ideal. Modern life is complicating the picture, I understand, because they are protected, but uh, nevertheless they are subject to a lot of attacks from uh, toxic products, pollution, etc. That's right. Do you think that their recovery might be jeopardized by this situation? Oh, I'm sure it will be, unless we take strong measures to correct the pollution of the waters, the oceans of the world. In here locally, we're struggling to control our sewage effluent, and we're trying to stop, of course, the use of detergents that help contaminate the ocean, as well as the use of pesticides like chlorinated hydrocarbons that can become cumulative in animals like the sea otter. I'm even more worried by uh, the actions of men than by pollution. For example, uh, if these otters are living in this forest of kelp, they're going to cut these kelps in order to make chemicals out of it. Fishermen who are growing a balloon, eh? They know that sea otters eat abalone, and so otters are the villains. By oversimplification, men are completely spoiling the picture. They don't understand that everything is tied up, and that otters are protecting the abalone indirectly, uh, as well as the kelps. Uh, and they, they, this is really what worries me. Right? They, no, nobody is really believing that, uh, that life is complex. Don't you think this is the main oh, danger? Oh, I do, but what good is it to man if we can't have the sea otters pelt? If we're not able to market it, yeah. if no one's able to make a lot of money on the sea otter, then it has to go. But the sea otters are doing their best not to go. In courtship, the male shows great tenderness toward the coy, thinner-necked female. They nuzzle and fondle and nip each other. Then the male tries to grab the female's nose with his jaws to hold her tight in order to mate in the water. The love play sometimes gets rough. Once the eager male has grasped the increasingly submissive female by the nose, there is again great tenderness in their movements. The nose bite by the male is believed to cause ovulation. The female lies on her back, and embraced by the male, they swim together for as long as 55 minutes. The gentle waves serving as their nuptial bed. A mated female often seeks solitude. Her nose may be bruised by the breeding ritual, but she is content. Within her is the seed of continuance. In the peaceful life of the otter, a seldom seen display, two otters fighting. For the gentle sea otter, aggressive behavior is uncommon, even between competitive males during the mating season. The 
combatants will emerge from the bloodless battle, much less bruised than is the mated female, whom Philippe Cousteau now approaches. Philippe brings urchins to the sore-nosed otter so that he may observe her post-mating behavior. During the course of several feedings, a special rapport is established. In friendship, Philippe first offers, then teases her with a crab. A relationship must be secure to place a live crab on the stomach of a mated female with a sore nose eating a spiny urchin. Perhaps Philippe is straining the relationship when he attempts to record the sound of the otter eating. <laughs> to make amends for the intrusion, Philippe offers her an urchin. But it is not sufficient reparation. <laughs> to pacify the otter, an urchin is dropped. <laughs> Yeah. Philippe is surprised, but contends it was a love nip, not a bite. It's the same as when his female cat nips him out of affection, he says. Pregnant otters may be subject to sudden behavioral changes. The otter now rolls toward the men to drape herself in the kelp near the boat. She grooms contentedly. All is forgiven. The cloud of controversy continues to hang over the fate of the California sea otter. In Monterey, Captain Cousteau speaks with William Bryan of the advisory council of the Friends of the Sea Otter and Ellen Miller, concerned citizen. I would like to let the sea otters protect themselves and extend their range, and the government officials would like to extend their range for them and then keep them within given areas. They would like to move some sea otters so that in case we ever had uh, an oil spill, there would be other otters who would be protected, they think. But wherever they would move them, they would try to conf confine them to a limited area, which... And uh, it's uh, highly debatable if the otters will respect the regulations. Well, we'll even survive <laughs> and move, that's right. <laughs> In the uh, Alaskan transplants, yes. just in capturing animals for transportation, 50% of the animals were killed yes. in the netting operations. We have a very small amount of animals to begin with. Bill, what, uh, what would you say the, the dangers are that the uh, sea otters are facing today? The greatest danger to our friend is this conflict that has arisen between the commercial abalone interests and the survival of the otter because the commercial abalone fishermen want to have the otters removed from the southern portion of the range where these people gather abalone that live in your ocean and my ocean and they sell the abalone for five dollars and sixty cents a pound i don't think this is a very important food item to take no. care of the world population only a handful of commercial divers pocketbooks. At Morro Bay, fisherman Ernest Porter demonstrates the size of abalone commercial fishermen can legally harvest and presents his side of the argument to Cousteau. Now, you know we are interested in the sea otter. Yes. And I know that um, some of you 
think that the theater is interfering with your profession? Uh, how, how is it? How well, well, this is, is true. Uh, the sea otter in making its comeback is moving down the coast. And as it does, it's uh, reducing an exploited environment. But there are not that many yet, or are they? Well, the number of otters uh, that are in their total range is not the problem. It's a concentration of animals that have moved to a new feeding area that are doing the damage uh, to the commercial fishery and, in fact, uh, all of the nearshore fisheries. How many abalones do you think a, a sea otter can eat a day? Well, now, if you would, uh, if a sea otter was only taking abalones uh, of the size that uh, we pick, uh, approximately four or five abalones a day, uh, but the otter is uh, taking many little ones to make up for these few big ones. He has no size limit. Ernie, you know, the friends of the sea otter consider you as, you know, the dragon, the, the danger. The, the, you personify all the enemies of the sea otter to them. What's true in that? Well, that's what? not true. I am not the enemy of the sea otter that they say I am at all. They misconstrue this because they can use use me as the number one enemy that, that uh, destroys me before I even have a chance to show the other side. Yeah. And the other side is not the side against the sea otter, but it's the side against the so-called friends of the sea otter. They're my enemy, not the sea otter. What do you propose to do practically to solve this problem? Well, uh, I believe the otters should be managed by moving them out of the concentrations that are doing the damage. They should be spread throughout the state. We can't possibly try and move some and kill 50% of those we move. I want to prevent the California legislature and the commercial abalone interest from manipulating this fragile population. Friends of Sea Otters happen to be politically powerful enough to prevent anybody from doing anything. We're going to have to farm abalone. It's the only possible solution to their problems. Well, the California coastline, by the way, belongs to everyone. Some of these commercial divers are killing otters. This is true. They have uh, been pressured and lost their fishery to the extent of uh, actually shooting them. Some blood present about both about the nasal and, uh, and oral mucus, mucus membranes. They're killing the animals because they've reached a simplistic solution to a problem. With proper management, the otter can uh, make friends as he goes down the coast and up the coast instead of producing enemies wherever he goes. I think we have a friend in the otter, and an animal which probably contributes a great deal towards the normal balance of the marine environment. As men debated their future, life continued for this handful of wild creatures. After their miraculous recovery, they are confronted with a modern peril, oil spills. These devoted mothers carry their sucklings on their chests for more than a month, caring for them constantly, keeping them warm, dry, and well-fed. An audacious older pup leaves his mother for a free meal and gets a flipper in the face. The otters have but one pup every two or three years. It makes their comeback slow, but because of the meticulous care by the mother, the mortality rate is low. The otter handles her baby tenderly, caressing and cooing it to sleep. Older pups take solid foods, which are provided them by industrious mothers. The otter doesn't like to leave her pup, but at times she must to seek food for him. The pup is too buoyant to dive and floats like a cork. He looks toward his mother in the surf and cries his distress. The mother reassures him and hunts. By the time the mother appears, the pup is floating near the rocks. She must swim her baby out of danger. For ages, matchless mothering has helped safeguard the delicate survival of the sea otter. 
today their continuance is threatened by a new danger, increasingly frequent oil spills. For the second time, the sea otter is at the mercy of a recent arrival, Homo sapiens, as capable of cruelty and selfishness as of generosity and compassion. After six weeks, Esprit, the bold one, comes regularly to the Archaea, the large and once frightening boat to be fed. In their work with the wary sea otters, as the time for the team's departure from Monterey grows nearer, it is the open, unqualified trust of the bold one that they hold most dear. Delcouter bids the otter fond adieu. Our mind is conditioned by civilization and makes our relationship with the higher animals difficult. We often feel embarrassed when we are faced with demonstrations of total confidence that we may not deserve. The men of Calypso know it is meaningless to attribute human feelings to animals. Yet, there is a flow of life from animal to man. Special empathy with all our friends in the sea enriches our understanding of ourselves. Body and soul, we are deeply rooted in nature. <laughs> 